Recon campaign is, unsurprisingly, one based around fighting as much as possible to spill the most blood and collect the most skulls you can to appease the god of bloodshed himself. Your purpose is to tear through the map and take out whatever you find in front of you, and leave nothing but destruction and ruins in your wake as your faction picks up the pieces left behind. They are a truly unique faction that hit the sweet spot between all-out war and fun infrastructure management pretty perfectly. Let's first go over the pros and cons of the Korn campaign gameplay. As I mentioned, they are there to fight constantly, and you really can do this as the faction can move long distances after battle victories, allowing you to fight many times per turn and move large distances across the map as you do so. You can also raise almost everything you find to net you passive buffs and bonuses, as well as automatically colonising anything that shares a province with one of your settlements, allowing you to get the best of both worlds. All this fighting and destruction also only buffs your faction even further, with many bonuses for the constant fighting and of course, the harvesting of skulls. As for the cons, the constant fighting does of course come at the cost of constant casualties, especially if you aren't manually fighting every single time. This means you can struggle to keep units alive early on before you unlock any replenishment buffs, and must spend a good chunk of change on global recruitment to replace any lost units. If you aren't fighting for any reason like recruitment or replenishment, your army is going to suffer with worse stats as well as reducing your faction's growth, meaning you really do come to a halt when you aren't fighting. And of course, the downside of constantly needing to battle is that you don't really have the chance to make many friends, so you'll end up at war with pretty much everyone, which might not be so bad early on, but later, when they all descend on you to take you out, it could very quickly turn bad. At the moment, Khorne only has access to one faction, the Exiles of Khorne. They are led by Scarbrand the Exiled, and for their faction effects, armies are granted replenishment in foreign territory, they have minus 10 diplomatic relations with Khorne 8 factions, and gain 25% campaign move range after raising a settlement. As for Scarbrand's army itself, they gain plus 35 campaign move range after winning a battle, and minus 35% recruitment cost in enemy or raised territory. They start in Infernius in the northwestern Chaos Wastes. For their starting army, they gain two Blood Letters, two Blood Crushers of Khorne, Chaos Warhounds, and a Blood Shrine of Corn. Their climate preferences, Frozen, Wasteland, Mountains, and Chaos Wasteland are suitable. Temperate, Temperate Island, Savannah, Desert, and Jungle are unpleasant, and Magical Forest and Ocean are uninhabitable. When playing as them, initially you want to secure your starting province, and this will take you south as well as east, allowing you to take two provinces in not much time, as long as the Drawn to Destruction is working correctly. After this, you want to head west and take the fight to Slanesh early on, as if you let them build power, they will be harder to take out later. This should take you a decent chunk of time, after which you want to head back east to secure more lands in the Chaos Wastes before heading to take on the Realms of Man, if you so desire. You don't really have to, as the Chaos Realms have more than enough lands to allow you to beat the campaign, but if you want to slow down or even take out some of those pesky Kislev factions, then go right ahead. Coming now to the faction mechanics, first up we have Skulls. Now Skulls are a currency in the faction that I gain from pretty much everything. You gain them from buildings, battles, events, raising settlements, collecting skull piles which are formed around the sites of battles with many casualties, certain technologies, and certain unholy manifestations. They are then spent on a number of things, certain events, colonising settlements, technology, and of course, the skull throne. Placing skulls on the throne requires 2,000 skulls, but this can be reduced with technology. Doing this nets you some faction buffs for 10 turns, and you can do it every 10 turns, so in theory, these buffs can be on permanently. You gain 25% campaign move range after raising a settlement, plus 25% to post battle loot, a summon ability for all armies in battle, and plus 2 units to your blood host's creation. And that brings me nicely to our next mechanic, Drawn to Destruction. Now, Khorne doesn't have the same options when colonising or occupying settlements as other factions. He has to spend 2500 skulls when taking any settlement to correctly decorate it in the name of the Blood God. To get around this, when you own any settlement in a region, you have a small chance to automatically colonise any ruins in the same region, which costs you no skulls. This means you are encouraged to take one settlement per region and then raise the rest. And of course, you also have a couple of unique options when raising. You can raise to harvest skulls, which will net you a thousand skulls, or you can choose to raise and summon a blood host army, which are the same as normal armies in every way, but they can't replenish or recruit new units, and after a number of turns, they will start to take attrition until they disappear completely. These armies can also be improved via research and the Skull Throne sacrifices to contain more and more powerful units. Our next mechanic is Bloodletting. Bloodletting is fairly similar to the old fightiness mechanic from the Greenskins. It's essentially a bar that fills up as you fight and win more battles on consecutive turns or even within the same turn. The more battle victories you get, the more the bar climbs, and the more buffs your army and faction gain. You gain increased replenishment and growth faction wide, increased local corn corruption, and upkeep and global recruitment reduction for that army. However, if your army is inactive, your level will drop, and if it drops too low, you will suffer growth reductions faction-wide and minus 10% melee attack for that army. Khorne also makes use of the Winds of Magic, and while this may not be in the traditional spellcasting sense, having high Winds of Magic for your army is still something worth doing. 
Next to your army can see the level, and having a high level grants bonuses to campaign movement range and spell resistance. However, letting the level fall too low results in debuffs to casualty replenishment, leadership and physical resistance. Some of his army movement stances increase and decrease this, while it's hardly going to mean the difference between victory and defeat, it does help to have it as high as possible whenever you can. Of course, like all other Chaos factions, Khan has access to the Unholy Manifestations, and you can unlock them as you spread more corruption throughout the map. Eternal War is unlocked from the start, and allows you to summon a hostile army to attack one of your armies. It seems weird, but it's actually really useful for maintaining your bloodletting level, so if an army is going to lose some levels, pop this on them, and they'll be safe for another few turns. Call of Battle requires 1000 corruption map-wide, and grants plus 50% campaign move range to a target army for that turn only. And of course, this one's great when you're trying to move an army long distances. Slot Incarnate requires 2000 corruption map-wide, and grants plus 100% skulls from kills for 4 turns for a target army. Can't go wrong using this on an army that's going to be doing a lot of fighting to grind skulls as quickly as possible. And finally, Khan's Gaze requires 3000 corruption map-wide, and raises the settlement local to the target army, and grants 10,000 skulls upon completion, but the army cannot move for 3 turns. This can be a useful one for getting a tasty number of skulls, as well as removing a settlement without the need for a fight. Of course, alongside this, Khan also takes part in the Great Game. If your branch of Chaos has the most corruption on the game map, it ascends and grants bonuses to your Unholy Manifestations. Eternal War now summons a larger army, which means more skulls and more XP for the target army, but you do need to fight the stronger army. Call of Battle now grants plus 100% campaign move range, Slaughter Incarnate now grants 200% skulls from kills, and Khan's Gaze now grants 15,000 skulls upon completion. And finally, Khan also of course has access to cults, just like all the other Chaos Factions, and you can create cults inside of enemy settlements if there is a high level of your Khan Chaos Corruption in that settlement. Inside these cults you can build one of four buildings, Hideouts which grant you 25 skulls per turn, Fighting Pits which grant 100 skulls every time a battle is fought in the province, Lodges which grant 40 skulls whenever a Lord is present, and arenas, which instantly teleport the faction leader to the location upon completion, but destroys the cult. Now come to the Lord's skills. First up, we of course have Scarbrand the Exiled. You're going to go blue line first as usual, and to go with the con playstyle, we're going to pick up casualty replenishments and raiding income. After that, we're going across to get Lightning Strike and Call to Bloodletting for those extra skulls, and finally, Claimer of Skulls for all kinds of powerful campaign buffs. After this, I would go into his raiding Carnet line and pick up literally everything there, since they are all super strong. Then I went into his Brutal Charge line to make him into even more of a one-man army. I would pick up whatever you want here since they are all really great, but I went with Maim, Destroy and Slaughter for the melee attack, physical resistance and speed. Then Murder, Hunt and Cleave for HP, speed and even more attack, as well as both of those abilities. We're then going to go into the Red Tree to buff those units we're using in the endgame, and of course this is up to you. I went with Skull Takers and Harbingers of Death, then Khan's Chosen, Rush to Slaughter and Forged in Blood. And finally, you want to grab any resistances you need from the top, as well as Bones' versus Slanesh, if you can't take them out earlier on. The Heralds of Khan have skill trees very similar to Scarbrand, so you're going to want to copy his blue and red lines, but with these guys they aren't quite as powerful fighters, so I would pull that off until later if I can. I would also grab one of their Locust talents at level 13, and they are all great choices, so follow your heart here, but I quite like Wrath. After that's all done, you can go to the top row, grab one of their mounts, some resistances, buffs versus Slanesh, and of course, Immortality. And like all Heralds of Chaos upon reaching level 15, these guys will be given the choice to evolve into Greater Demons. You can also choose to remain as Heralds or delay the choice by 10 turns, and I would suggest upgrading every single time since these lads are seriously strong. They evolve into the Exalted Bloodthirsters, and again, these guys have extremely similar trees to the Heralds, aside from different abilities in the yellow line, different talents unlocked to level 13, and no mounts. I would go into the blue, and then the yellow, and then red, and round it out with one of the three level 13s, I prefer Wrath of Khan, and anything you want from the top row, and you'll be copying Scarbrand in pretty much all of those places, just make sure to pick up Immortality as soon as you can. Now comes to the heroes, first up we have the Cultists of Khan. on the campaign map these guys can damage enemy walls, wound characters, hinder replenishment, spread corruption locally, and increase the mobility of their embedded army. These lands want to be used almost exclusively in combat as they are decent fighters alongside having some powerful abilities. You want to grab their increased mobility to zoom your lords around the map. After this you want to go into their yellow line and you'll end up picking up everything here eventually, so just grab whatever you want in whichever order you feel. Once you can you want to grab a mount and the gate of corn abilities as they are extremely powerful when leveled up to completion. And finally you can grab their resistances, bonus versus slanesh, and of course immortality. Our other heroes are the Blood Reapers. On the campaign map, they can assault garrisons, assassinate enemy characters, assault units, spread control locally, and provide training for their embedded army. Now these are a multi-class hero, and they can be used one of two ways. If you want a campaign assassin, you want to grab everything in the blue tree but training, and then just wait for immortality. If you want them in battles, then you can grab training before heading straight to the yellow line to make them better at fighting in pretty much every single way. Similar to Cultists, you're going to end up grabbing everything here eventually, so follow your dreams and get exactly what you want. 
At level 13, you can grab one of their three locust skills, and again, they're all viable, so grab which you prefer. I quite like Wrath again. And finally, you can round it out with a mount of your choice, some resistances, Bus versus Slanesh, and of course, Immortality. Now come to the commandments of the faction. Destroy! Grants minus 10% construction cost for all buildings, plus 5% income from all buildings, and plus 1% meal attack for all armies faction-wide. This one is great for building up your settlements and increasing your passive income when the province isn't really doing anything else. Maim grants 4 control, minus 40% chance of plague spreading, minus 20% campaign move range for enemy armies starting their turn in the region, and plus 1% melee attack for all armies faction wide. This one is of course great for getting high control, as well as reducing plague spreading and slowing down any enemy armies if they're trying to invade. Kill grants plus 1 recruit rank, plus 1 local recruitment capacity, and plus 1% melee attack for all armies faction wide. Obviously, a great one for recruiting, nothing else to say there. And finally, Foster Cults grants plus 3 corn corruption locally, and plus 1 in adjacent provinces, is great when you're trying to raise the corruption and maybe prepare a neighbouring province for your invasion. And finally we come to the research tree. The corn tree has 8 pillars and each pillar has 8 techs and you must unlock 3 techs from each pillar to unlock the next one. Each tech costs skulls and they normally buff things like unit income, corruption and of course skull generation. As you advance through the pillars the techs cost more skulls and they contain more buffs for later game units, abilities and items. Research is one of the few things in the faction that doesn't move particularly quickly since you can't really increase the research rate, so getting to the final pillar is going to take you a pretty long time. I would try and get through the pillars as quickly as possible to unlock them all and come back later to unlock anything you missed that you think you might need. This is to make sure you can buff those late game units as you are able to use them rather than being several pillars behind. And that is everything you need to know about the Korn campaign gameplay. If you enjoyed this video then consider leaving it a like and of course subscribe to see more videos like this including the Korn battle guide coming on Friday. Leave any questions you have in the comments below and I'll answer them as best I can. I'd like to take this time to thank some supporters of the channel like Dominic Schmas and Adam T and of course Henry Tugger for their support at the Unclean Ones tier. If you'd like to support the channel, you can become a member here on YouTube, a subscriber on Twitch, or a patron on Patreon. Doing so gets you shout outs at the end of videos, just like all of these lovely people. Huge thanks to all supporters, one final thank you for watching, and for now, I've been Colonel Damders, and I will see you next turn.